Mr. Bashir, uh, this uh, is a, uh, yeah. about a presentation about policy instruments against price volatility, myth and reality. Uh, ten minutes for this presentation and then I will introduce the panelists and uh, the rules for this uh, panel session. Okay. Uh, I put a very provocative title of uh, my short presentation, but in fact I was asked and I prepare a presentation only including few introductory remarks. Uh, so let me start. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, it appears that uh, the problems of uh, uh, food prices volatility is very important. So uh, it has its effects, its negative effects, first on uh, food security, food security both for uh, developing countries and for emerging and uh, developed economies, uh, uh, countries. Also negative results on uh, the market participants, I mean uh, the farmers, consumers and other participants. It's obviously what is the negative effect on the farmers. They need a more stable economic environment in order to plan this investment decision. So they need uh, to, to plan some uh, cash flow, predictable cash flow. And with price volatility, it's impossible. So obviously, it's negative. This instability was addressed on numerous national and international uh, level. I should mention only a few of them. This is G20 uh, meeting in Cannes. <coughs> this is WTO uh, meeting in uh, Bali. Uh, the researches of uh, many international institutions like EU, World Bank, FAO, IFPRI, reports of uh, joint task force, etc. Uh, following the literature review, following the recommendation and the main body of all these researches, the policy measure proposed to deal with price volatility. I will not make a very comprehensive classification, but anyway, uh, they propose three groups of measures to deal with price volatility. The first group is uh, measures which prevent volatility or reduce it. The second are measures which cope with volatility. And the third are measures which manage, with which we manage the volatility. The most important measures of the first group could be classified in the way the first measure to increase productivity, sustainability, and uh, resilience of agriculture. In fact, these are uh, measures which are producer support policy measures. I will stress especially here for the measures which allow to the farmer to respond to, to price spikes. I mean to improve their access to credit, access to new technology, to avoid excessive regulation and standards, to focus on uh, product quality and sustainability aspect. Another measures from the first group which to prevent, uh, which are aimed to prevent the price volatility. Obviously, the measures which deal with market information and transparency, here included, for example, to improve, expand AMIS initiative, to find and keep key uh, indicators as transparent as possible, uh, to deal with the future markets, predictable governmental action, I mean, to different domestic policies as well as uh, trade policies. The other group of measures are measures <coughs> which are aimed to cope with volatility. These are national buffer stock, consumer support policy measures. Uh, this include different safety nets, risk management for vulnerable producers. Also, in these groups of uh, measures, uh, all the measures which are targeted at farmers, uh, which allow the farmers to cope with low prices and grain storage, uh, farm income support, uh, single farm payment, and other intervention measures, clear, simple rules which are applied. And the final group, uh, measures, policy measures which support the managing of volatility, I will just mention here the coordination between the policy, international and national policies, policies in relation to food price volatility. 
what are the challenges? I would say, <coughs> I would say first that uh, there is not a one market. One market is abstraction. So we have many markets. Each product has its markets with uh, market structure, with uh, relations, specific relation between supply and demand. So if you want to deal to a certain extent with price volatility, a uh, uniform policy is not possible. Uh, we need uh, policy measures which are fine-tuned to a specific market. On the contrary, with the globalization of the economy, price formation of uh, uh, most of the agricultural commodities receive more and more influence from macroeconomic factors uh, from global scale. So then uh, I'm asking my, uh, uh, me the question I here will cite uh, the words of uh, uh, Professor Saris, maybe they are not exactly, but the meaning, is it possible one to, to beat a market? If it is not a possible, because it, mm, the market forces, I think, especially a global market forces are something which is uh, behind uh, our possibilities, then isn't better we to recommend to the policy makers to use measures to cope than to prevent the volatility. Second uh, uh, issue, which I think should be discussed, is if you want to a certain extent to have an influence on the market, isn't it better to focus on uh, long-term drivers of the market? I just put <coughs> here some of them. It's not a full list. But for example, climate change and frequency of uh, increased frequency of extreme weather events, uh, developments of in consumption trends in production and agricultural policy <coughs> in India and China. Uh, maybe here the increased instability on Black uh, Sea region, uh, which is more and more important in the world market for the wheat. So isn't it better to concentrate on long-term drivers? if you want to prevent to a certain extent uh, the volatility, done on short-term measures which are impossible to be done. So these are uh, to my conclusions of uh, this short introductory uh, remarks. Thank you. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Manen. Who, who is this? Well, um, after this short introduction that I think that focus no, no, that's, no, no, we will pass the, the microphone. After this short introduction that uh, put uh, the central issues that uh, should be discussed, we uh, will start the, the panel. We have uh, five panelists. Uh, Concepcion Calpe, in my right, left, is uh, in Amy's, Amy's FAO. Uh, Tasos and Niotis, European Commission, DG Agri. Uh, Gabriel Pons, my right side, is uh, Oxfam. Paolo Gouveia, Copa Cojeca. And the last panelist is Gonzalo Ayres, ENESA, is the national entity on uh, agricultural insurance from Spain. I explain that because ENESA, maybe some people don't know what this means, really it means ENESA. Okay, the rules of the panel will be the follow, following. Uh, first, we have a, 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 a question, first round of the question, the same question for the five panelists. Each panelist will have five minutes to present the comments and suggestions or conclusions. This first question is about the past experience on dealing with uh, uh, price food volatility. Uh, we will have a second round of question, the same question for the five panelists about the future perspective, let's say, what would be the, the priorities in, in, in policies for, for dealing with food price volatility in the future. Then we will have 15 minutes to across comments among the panelists to provoke uh, some debate among them. And finally, we have uh, a space for questions from the floor. 
Uh, the people that want to ask some question have to write the question. Uh, I will classify, order the questions and address to the specific panelists the questions. And finally, we'll have a third question that is a very important question for Ulysses project. That is a question for the f five panelists. Uh, a sort of a final statement about w which kind of problems or future uh, questions or, or new perspective that should be taken into account from Ulysses' team. This is a requirement of the project and it's very important to, to, to finalize this, this uh, seminar with these uh, uh, comments or final statements from the panelists. Okay, let's uh, start with the first question. The first question is the following. Um, which types of measures have been effective or successful in the past for preventing volatility, coping with volatility, and managing volatility? We will start in this round from uh, Concepcion, Concha. You can start. Uh, well, I think we have discussed that uh, heavily over the last two days, so I, I, I fear that I'm going to have to repeat certain things that have been already highlighted. Um, personally, I'm more a person that thinks that fundamentals are those that drive the market and that dri also drive the, the volatility much more than uh, financial markets. And uh, so um, I was uh, about the policies. Um, of course, uh, I, I, I totally agree that uh, uh, it would be crazy for governments to try to uh, outsmart the market. And that so it, it's very important to define the role of government and when there is a need to intervene. Uh, but this is for governments. And of course, uh, in this case, if we think that there is some intervention there is a need for contingency plans because very often it's the speed of the policies implementation that matters, not so much the nature of the policies, but how fast it can be implemented. Otherwise, because uh, by nature, very often uh, a price spike is, is very fast. It may have a very strong impact, but it doesn't last for very long. And therefore, often the measures that are implemented uh, are taken too late to have an effective uh, mm -hmm. effect. And I remember, for instance, when there was um, the 2008 crisis uh, for rice, there was a long discussion uh, by Japan on whether they could use the imported rice to uh, put it in the market and to relieve, uh, to relieve the, 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 the pressure on prices. Uh, before it could do that, it had to enter into consultations with the, the US government because it was American rice. By the time a decision was taken, there was no need for taking this action. So rather than the nature, I'm, I'm discussing here about what kind, I mean, uh, what char characteris characteristics of the policy sh should have in order to, to be effective. It, they can, you cannot adopt a policy that will take years to, to uh, or, or even months or even weeks to, to implement if you want to, to have an effect uh, um, for the short term. And this is for the government. But of course, there are policies that consumers can take for their, I mean, now we have, the policies is one, is one size, but what do the consumers and the, con and the producers do when, when they face these type of problems? Of course, the consumers in certain countries, I mean, they have their income uh, that allows them to, to uh, to continue buying and uh, they are not so much affected in their consumption. In other countries, it was very important to have um, alternative foods like the traditional foods, like the non-traded commodities, even though there was also some price uh, contagious, contagion. Uh, 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 cassava prices, this uh, route uh, that is very common, or millet prices also rose, but to some extent there was it, 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 it helped consumers 
to uh, to buffer these uh, the, the effect of the high prices on on rices or on other commodities. So uh, for producers, of course, you have other strategies that uh, they, they are being implemented, and of course uh, the fact that of contract farming and and diversification, not to to produce only one product. So there are strategies that are being followed by the major players. The government, uh, I think, has taken various set of measures. I don't want to go over the, 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 the buffer stocks, uh, the, 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 the policies of import uh, type reduction. All these measures were uh, um, uh, taken in a context uh, often that did not allow them to really uh, alleviate the problem. Okay, let's move the Tassos and Newtis with the same question. Uh, approach. Eh? Uh, it's fantastic. There you go. If you the, the, if diversi you have rules, the diversity is a very good... Uh, yeah. If you have rules and it is, yes, exactly, in a research environment organized by a university, you have the temptation to try to, to tweak them a bit. Now, uh, what I wanted to do is I took uh, at face value the title of myth uh, realities last evening and this morning because some of the discussion uh, I think was in about to revive some things where we thought were things of the past. And uh, in the first part of my intervention, I would like to focus a little bit on uh, three broad issues, on past measures, price support uh, versus volatility, the impact internally on internal and external markets, Second, the link of support prices with the target. Is it income or uh, is price, income, or the volatility that they're targeting it? And third, briefly discuss about stocks. I will go very fast on the, some of the slides, but you will have them, of course, and look them at your ease. This is the wheat graph that you saw yesterday, but it doesn't start from a period that we had high support prices. It starts from the period which is about the period that I entered the Fischler government uh, cabinet, which is a period where the intervention price was already at 101 euros per metric ton. And you see two very distinct developments here. You see a period where our domestic prices were pretty much fluctuating with world market prices up until uh, the beginning of the boom. And then you see another period where, again, our domestic prices are fluctuating with world market prices. But in these two distinct periods, both characterized by the same internal support and external protection, you have a completely different world environment. So you, the same policy measure, internally and externally, broadly speaking, the Americans had the same policy over this period of time, a completely different situation in terms of volatility, and in terms of the potential impact or irrelevance of this policy measure on that. Second market, this is the beef market. Here things are less volatile, although moving upwards. Our internal support price has gone way down to, uh, to areas where most people think it's totally relevant, even as a safety net. And there are three completely different price developments. Brazil, US, and the European Union. And of course here you don't only have an internal support price, you have <coughs> external protection. But you also have something which is extremely important. We're not a net exporter getting rid of our surpluses with export subsidies. We're the largest net importer. And there is no use of export subsidies. Third market, and that's the one I would like to focus a little bit more. This is the dairy market. This is a market where the intervention price in equivalent measures here, because we don't have it in, in milk, we have it in butter and in cheese, but we converted it in milk equivalent price, has been going down. The world market price, the green line, which was way below where the EU price was, has come in closer and closer to the EU price. It's much more volatile than the EU market price, and both of them in the last period are significantly increasing. First question mark, what is going on? Uh, Internally, what is going on is a rather standard process of milk production and milk price evolution in the European Union. Something else must be going on outside. And you see it when you look at the break in the manner by which 
the food price indices of FAO are moving. I took out a lot of other commodities and focused only on dairy, cereals and food. Why? Because in the past it used to be that dairy prices increased first and dropped afterwards first, but more or less they followed what happened in the other indices. It doesn't seem to give, be the case in recent years. Another reason for search for an explanation, part of it is there. This is what is happening in China, the very significant increase in Chinese imports, and the lack of the capacity of domestic supply to pick up what is going. And here I come also with a couple of things, not only about how we look in the past, and whether and what type of approaches do you have of dealing with this in the future, if any. In the red circle, you have the period of what is termed the dairy crisis in the European Union. A very significant increase in dairy prices and a dramatic collapse of dairy prices. This, by the way, doesn't happen in the absence of dairy quotas. It happens in the presence of dairy quotas. And it might have been accentuated exactly because we had the presence of dairy quotas that didn't allow the rapid adjustment of production to market signals. What you do have after that is a recovery, and up until 2013, which is the actual figures, some variability of prices, some volatility at much higher prices. And the real question mark is, what about the future? This is a line that has been criticized, I think, uh, that we have lost Professor Menge, but it's being taped, so he can hear my comments. This is a criticism of the Agling, FAO, and all the other modeling approaches that it is relatively flat. Of course it's relatively flat because you, assume you have to assume constant yields and constant macroeconomic conditions, but that's not exactly what we're doing to arrive at this line. The first thing we're doing is play with various scenarios. This is one of many scenarios of a price uh, around the average, but clearly more volatile. Uh, this is a low price scenario with some low 10th percentile interval. This is a, a high uh, interval and a higher price scenario. And uh, where is Robert? He said that you did almost 700 or 600 such scenarios, which looks like a spaghetti if you de derive it. But it's not coming out of the blue. The average price scenario is based on this type of assumptions on macroeconomic, uh, the EU dairy market, and other major players' markets. Very uh, concrete and also linked and coherent among them developments. Uh, yes, it is possible to have a drought in one part of the world that affects droughts in other parts of the world. And we do have experiences and occurrences in the past that explain to do that. This is, these are some conditions of a high and some conditions of a low price scenario. So we'll stop here with the past policies to briefly focus on three things. The first is something that I repeated also in my introductory statement yesterday. We're living in a price environment that has nothing to do with what we faced in the past. Therefore, continuing a debate about the type of policy measures we had in the past even we, if we tend to nostalgically to glorify their impact in some respects, is as if we're actually driving a car and looking always at a rear view mirror. This is not the new environment we will face. And therefore, the focus on whether you have price support, price income or not, should be put in context. In the graph that you've seen, yes, the support price of the European farmers has gone down. But what has also happened is not only more price volatility, but a higher fixed level of income support. 40 something billion euros annually. This has an impact not on reducing price volatility, but uh, on reducing the impact on price volatility on income volatility. Is that what we want? and allow the market signals to tell farmers what to do? Or do we want to go back to a situation where the market signals don't play a role? And bet we better look also at income statistics in the past to see whether they were more volatile. And finally, on the level of stocks, uh, I will not say anything but briefly agree fully with what, uh, uh, with what Aleko said yesterday and so many others have said. The moment that you decide to have a fixed rule on how you purchase stocks, and we have a, 
Eckhart was in the budget before, and he knows what it means. <laughs> assume that you have a fixed role. Who is going to assume the policy and the political responsibility afterwards when people start attacking in, in a very intransparent way what you have transparently announced that is going to be the manner by which you intervene in markets. So that, for this reason alone, any global assumption of intervening in stocks, especially when prices is high, the only impact it will have is increased volatility and the level of prices. What could happen in local markets is a completely different story. I don't profess to be an expert on developing countries, but I think there are other people that are more competent in explaining that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about developing countries. Uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about the obvious measures that can work, uh, those that, no, that uh, are not contentious uh, as syst information systems or uh, improving production or infrastructure. This is obvious. Uh, the contentious one, uh, as we have s uh, seen in these days, uh, are mainly the, the food stocks and the use of food stocks uh, during the, the price spikes. Um, uh, most of you are scholars, some practitioners. Um, the problem is dealing with politicians at what they do. When there is a price spike in a developing country, governments have to act. And uh, many times they don't do it in the best uh, or smart way. They do what they need to do, essentially, to conserve the power and to avoid riots. So uh, there is no question that they have to intervene in the markets in the case of a price spike. The issue could be uh, the size of the intervention, and it seems uh, in these two days that uh, food emergency reserves, uh, there is a consensus about that. But nowadays, uh, the, pies, uh, the, the, the food crisis are access prices. They affect to a lot of people. And usually, the size of the classical food emergency reserves are not enough. We are talking about 10 million, 12, 12 million people affected. Our proxy is not uh, usually the, mm, the, the level of price only, is people not eating, people dying. So governments will do something. Um, are, uh, then food reserves are perhaps the second best solution and the issue should be how to deal better with them. Um, in a study made by FAO, uh, published uh, this year, uh, three out of four countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa used uh, food reserves to cope with the price spikes. So they are a reality, they are there. It's better to think how to uh, manage them better instead of saying, like scholars, no, this is not an optimal solution. It's not possible, not the reality. Now I'm going to talk about the, the support to the producers. This is the other issue that is very important, obviously, for, for Oxfam. Uh, it's not very, uh, it's, it's not a, a, an easy issue because there are a lot of different constraints that we have to cope with. It's not only technical issues uh, related to agronomy, it's uh, markets, it's credit, it's insurance, very needed uh, the insurance for the poor producers. And uh, one uh, very important and related to the issues we are talking is uh, food reserves, uh, the local food reserves managed uh, by smallholders. Um, uh, local food reserves have been uh, a very also contentious issue because uh, many of you can think that is a, a failed a story uh, buried by, his, by, by history. But uh, we have been mapping uh, how uh, healthy are them, and they are quite alive. Uh, I'm going to show mm. the results of the mapping. 
in West Africa. This is only the beginning. You can see a lot of uh, uh, federations of local food reserves working. Uh, first in the, still in the, in the first one, yes. These are the different federations that we have seen that uh, exist in West Africa. Uh, can you click on w uh, one of them? We have the information with uh, the objectives that they have. The objectives basically are two. Uh, uh, or they want to uh, ensure the availability of food, or they want to increase the income of poor producers. And they work in a completely different way with different consequences. Let's go now to the, to the detail. This is uh, the detail of, uh, um, it's called Bind the Sedure, so serial banks in, in Chad. We have been mapping uh, and uh, achieving information on each one of uh, the serial banks of, of an entire region. This is important because we have to know very well how they, fu how they function and even um, how is the state uh, of the food security because their functioning can be taken as a proxy to inform the food security in the area. Uh, you can even uh, see the cereal bank there, it's there in the center. And you can click and have all the information about the cereal bank and how they are performing this year related to, to other years. Uh, why this is important? We recognize that market interventions can harm the only solution that we are uh, using to manage the stocks. They are hurt by the, the, the market interventions, and this is a problem. And perhaps there are problems that have no solution. It's difficult. But we have to take them in account in order to uh, keep them al alive and uh, um, look for ways to protect them from the market interventions. But at the same time, the, var the market interventions are needed because we are talking about millions of people. So there is possible contradiction there. But uh, we have to study how to cope with this. Uh, and I will finish here. Thank you. Paulo? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's working. Well, I would... I would like to uh, not address immediately the, the question that was put, just to refer that we have been talking about price volatility. Yes, that is uh, uh, an issue. But for us, and what we have said, uh, especially at the onset of this uh, uh, crisis in 2007, is volatility per se is not a problem. What is really a problem is when this volatility becomes excessive. Uh, and excessive both in terms of uh, the amplitude of the, the, the fluctuations and in the frequency that they occur. Because in, in reality, farmers are used to cope with what I would call normal volatility. I mean, the, uh, you, you can look at different uh, commodities and you see that the price is not the same throughout the year. And farmers adapt to that in order to make the best of these fluctuations of, uh, of prices. So it's the, really the issue of excessiveness of this uh, volatility that is a problem. I won't go into how you measure uh, or how do you detect that it's excessive. I mean, uh, uh, yesterday we had uh, quite a, an interesting uh, presentation on, on that. But this is, this is uh, really uh, the problem. Now, what are uh, the, the issues that cause it or the issues that will have uh, a direct result of this excessive uh, volatility. I mean, at the, end of, at the end of the day, it will end up with a level of uncertainty that the farmer will not 
uh, will not be able to cope with this uncertainty. And farmers, they need to have a, a certain degree of uh, certainty so that they can carry on with their activities, that they can invest. But if there is no uncertainty, and if the, and if the result of these price spikes and price lows uh, reflects at the end of the day on his income, then we have a problem because there will be no capacity to invest and to take measures to reduce uh, and manage uh, the, the risks associated with, uh, with this uh, uh, activity. So <coughs> there are many uh, elements and I think that we, we, we don't have, I would say we don't have any successful uh, policies to, to address this or successive uh, uh, tools. And uh, we are at a, a crucial moment, and as Tasso said, we are starting a new era in terms of policies. And the old tools that we use to manage the market, they are gone. And especially with the, the 2003 reform, they, they were taken away from the toolkit of the CAP. What we, we need to do now, and looking at, uh, at the future is, what kind of tools can we really consider, can we really develop that are practical and of rapid reaction to address these issues? And I, I, I'm not even going to enter into uh, the, the lateral aspects that are very relevant of the functioning of the chain and the unbalance of power and uh, the unfair trading practices and how uh, all of the concentration that uh, has been happening both upstream and downstream from, from agriculture has had a, an impact. But these are aspects that need to be taken into consideration, as well as the political dimension of, of, of things. And quite often we see uh, reactions or statements or comments made by uh, politicians that will have an impact on, on the markets. And we as farmers, we are vocation for, for the market. We operate for the market. And this is, this is where, at the end of the day, our focus needs to be. But something that uh, Tasso said is also very important. Currently, farmer's income is still very much below the level of uh, income in other sectors of the activity. And if we look at it, the level of direct payments accounts still for, on average, EU27, I think it's 40% 40, 40 of the income. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tassos. But this is, I believe, a, a, a crucial element that still uh, highlights the need to have uh, a policy like, uh, like the, the CAP. Of course, we just reformed the CAP. Everything will be uh, being put in place for, for, for next year, and we will see how things go. But more and more farmers need to be attentive to market signals and they will need to have tools to respond uh, to this in, the, in, a, in a more practical manner. One of the elements that I would refer to is uh, the extension in the framework of the new CAP, the extension of producer organizations, this figure of producer organizations to all other sectors. This gives farmers really uh, a possibility of grouping up and trying to hedge some of uh, uh, the, let's say, uncertainties uh, uh, of the market and as well as contributing to have a better positioning uh, in it. So at least these are just some of my thoughts, maybe not very well organized in terms of a, a logical sequence, but I tried to pinpoint several of the issues that uh, I've been hearing comments uh, between yesterday and this morning. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, thank you for inviting Nessan. I would like to apologize on behalf of the director who couldn't make it today here. So um, in this panel, I would like to contribute with some ideas on risk management related measures that, uh, that deal with coping with volatility, not managing it. And um, we, we have some experience in, in Spain with these kind of measures, and I would like to, to name three of them that I can think are interesting. And these are fiscal measures, credits, and insurances. About fiscal measures, uh, what we do is that uh, 
we help for we 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 can help for areas under under distress uh, that may be um, every year or every other year, uh, depending on the cause of distress, some sectors or areas, even to the um, to the level of a village, uh, have reductions in the tax payments. And uh, we have had the case, for example, a couple of years ago, that uh, we help. Well, the, the government helped uh, livestock producers because of the high fluctuation of prices. And uh, well, the kind of measures could help them to cope with this volatility. Other kind of measures are these private credit loans with public endorsement. Uh, this type of credit usually gets cheaper than uh, personal credits in the market. Uh, the idea of these uh, measures is that uh, there was a difference of up to two points in the interest rates of these credits. Uh, in, two, in the years 2010-2011, uh, because of this um, price fluctuation, the, the state subsidized the some quarter of a point of the uh, interest rates, but uh, we learned some lessons from that, is that uh, the farmers, they said that th th that made no, di no real difference for them. The real difference was uh, they didn't have the real access to the credits. So in the next uh, measures, what we did is that we uh, put the money, instead of of um, subsidizing the, the credit rates, we subsidize the public endorsement for these credits. So that, that made a real difference. So the they farmers could access the, the uh, credits in times of uh, credit uh, limitation. And uh, in, those, in that moment, the banks were more eager to, uh, to lend the money to them. And the third measure that I would like to, to talk about is insurances. We know that uh, volatility leads to uncertainty. We, we've heard this several times here. And um, we know that uh, under these circumstances uh, of uncertainty, the lack of exposure of uh, farmers to risk, whether they are climatic, whether they are price uh, risk, um, taking out this uncertainty increases the possibility to access to loans, to, uh, to make further investments, to make investments into adaptation to climate change and, well, in, in any of these ways to, to, um, to arrive to more sustainable uh, business. So um, yesterday, Professor Sari, I remember that he said that uh, farmers care about unexpected risk and that was insurance is about. We have been offering crop insurance for 35 years now and uh, through a public partnership uh, public-private partnership. And uh, this day, w w I, we sign about uh, 380,000 um, insurance policies every year <coughs> with um, 10, billion, 10 billion euros of uh, capital insured, which is a lot for, for any country, but uh, for, for Spain, it, it really is. And uh, this, this policy comes, of course, at a cost. It comes at a cost at, of uh, almost 200 million euros per year, but, but we have also to take into account that um, we have diminished the uh, need of subsidies for catastrophic events to some, ca some hundred of thousand of euros every other year. Not so we, we, we get to get a, a public budget more stable and more even. And we are now, for example, this year, we're trying to link this kind of policies because this year, for example, we are linking the, this kind of credits uh, of, uh, with public endorsement. Uh, the, the, the farmers that have an insurance policy with them, that have signed them, they have better conditions for these credits. So we try to encourage the, um, the insurance with this kind of uh, linked measures. So. Um, we think that all these measures, they don't uh, deal directly with uh, price volatility, but they, they uh, help them to have a more stable income. And we are even uh, putting this, these measures and this experience on, on cooperation, because we, we have uh, programs with, uh, with well, some people here with uh, AgroSeguro and with Al Alberto Garrido also is helping us with that in, in República Dominicana, in in Vietnam, in Chile, or Peru, dealing with this kind of, of measures there. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, several panelists um, comment about that we are entering in a new era on the international uh, markets and also on international environment. And I think that this is very opportune, the second question, that uh, in the future, uh, which could be really the main policies to deal with uh, price volatility, um, what would be the priority for the future? Is really the measures, the policy measures, uh, trying to cope or trying to prevent? Is possible to prevent? Is possible to avoid volatility, to limit volatility, to reduce volatility? This is possible, really. In the future, you have to pr to concentrate in this kind of measures, or maybe the priority uh, should be uh, coping with volatility from the different actors, for consumers, for producers, for uh, the chain value, etc. Uh, for these answers, uh, I would like to uh, change the order. Maybe you could start, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, from the developing countries' point of view, uh, the, the most needed uh, intervention for sure is investment in agriculture increase the production. Uh, nowadays is 10 years from the Maputo uh, commitment to devote in Africa 10% of budgets uh, in agriculture. Uh, very few countries are doing this. The other one would be uh, uh, we need a, a better implementation of what uh, governments are doing. What I said before, that they are going to invest in forest reserves anyway. So the good measure would be capacity building. We have been here talking about um, models that are like Ferraris. And in developing countries, uh, I don't know if everybody knows the, the Tata, the Indian car. They are using this kind of very simple measures uh, with not a good control of, wha of what's happening. A good capacity building in order to do things better would be important. Uh, another thing would be uh, to invest in social protection. Social protection not only during the, the price spikes, but uh, a constant uh, permanent social protection structure that can be scaled up in case of problems to cover more people. Some measures could be uh, new measures and a bit more, more, more specific. For instance, index insurance. Index insurance is not a new measure. What is new is index insurance used as social protection. We as Oxfam uh, are uh, piloting uh, a project in Ethiopia with the government uh, of Ethiopia and Swiss Re and uh, WFP. And what we are doing is using the programs of WFP instead of giving people working in the program uh, food or money, we give them uh, an index insurance. And this is going, uh, this is uh, being a huge success with thousands of people insuring in this way. Because if not, the poorest people have not access to insurance, even if there is an uh, insurance scheme in the country, because they can't afford to pay for it. Another one would be creating a linking information systems at different levels. We know very good information systems because it's important to know when, where, and for whom to act. So uh, the national systems should, link, should be linked to the community-based information systems in order to improve the information at local levels. Norway, we are using systems that they are not very precise at local level. And it's easy to make mistakes in, in the interventions. And as I have said, the serial banks should be included in this kind of information systems. And some measures uh, obvious would be to uh, in include farmer organizations in the management of government response. 
this could uh, decrease the mismanagement and even potentially mm, decrease the corruption. Uh, and more training, more creation of, of capacity. Um, the ultimate objective is to increase production of poor farmers and to increase food availability in cities at reasonable prices. And there are a lot of different things that we should do in order to, to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Sorry, thank you. Um, I think the, the first important distinction uh, we need to make when we discuss uh, what measures need to be taken in the future is a distinction that is coming evident from the type of issues I raised and the type of issues that you just raised. I mean, the, mm -hmm. there is an absolutely no comparison between what one needs to do in sub-Saharan Africa and developing countries and what needs to do in the developed countries. Uh, what is extremely interesting also to put in mind is on many occasions, the issue that and the debate is not about whether uh, food banks or local stocks in sub Saharan Africa are important or not, is whether India, for example, can use a mechanism which clearly is aimed at increasing the level of internal price support and claim that it's done for different reasons. And that's a completely different debate. Or the fact that China is still considered to be a developing country. And in the discussion we had in Emis two weeks ago in Canberra, the Chinese were claiming that they needed technical assistance to be able to collect information on stocks. Yes. So there are significant issues that need to be addressed. Now, are we living and entering into a new world? I mean, probably if I knew the exact answer, I might be working in a different job. Eh? But on the basis of all the analysis we have seen, and if really most of the influences of what is happening in, in the prices in agriculture are coming outside agriculture, they are exogenous to agriculture, and especially there is a strong energy link, then we have to ask ourselves what is the implication of the fact that all new forms of new energy, be it uh, fracking for gas, tar sand oil in Canada, deep sea oil in Brazil or elsewhere, require a cost of extraction that is much higher than what we use. It has a clear implication for, for Middle East, for example. That's why they, they are able to purchase all the football clubs in Europe, because the cost of extraction is very low. But for the rest, it implies probably a new price floor for agricultural commodities. At least that's the working assumption we make. It also implies a completely different structure in the cost of production, especially in the developed world, where agriculture is an energy-intensive sector. And that has implications everywhere. So the first implications we we'll have on the policy debate is to answer whether we need to cope or manage with volatility. And if, first of all, I personally believe it's better to cope than try to manage. And second, if most of the influences are exogenous, then trying to manage it endogenously in agriculture will lead to policy disasters. So what are some of the main areas that we need to try to focus. First of all, market transparency is extremely important. I mean, Amis has done some real good work in trying to harmonize the data that is available. There are some major players out there that have absolutely no justification in not making a greater effort to provide data. And that is an important element in terms of market tra transparency. Another area that is very, very important, and I hope you and universities support us by demanding more, is what happens in the area of statistics, where there is a real onslaught on statistics with the pretext of budgetary cuts. Budgetary cuts do not mean that you cut statistics. They mean that you can have synergies from the various sources of statistics, for example. Without them, we risk uh, observing, and not even being able to observe whether we have volatility or not in the future. Whatever policy measures are taken, price signals are important to be transmitted throughout, and especially throughout the food chain. And here is, well, we have seen it in the food uh, forum in, uh, in Europe, where the retail service is the one that has the most resistance 
in terms of opening up the data information. Uh, uh, most of us would have liked to have seen scan data on what exactly happens. It's uh, very interesting and they saw many, many things. There are many others that we can only guess, or there is anecdotal evidence, but not hard evidence. And finally, I think we need to accept uh, that volatility will stay beyond our control, but there are three very important areas which are interlinked where we need to focus on. More uh, focus on targeted research to increase productivity and also increase the transfer of knowledge through innovation and other schemes uh, to pass the information that exists in other parts. And that could is a very crucial element and for us is also a big bet because we're putting much more money on agricultural research and we need to see whether uh, any re real results will come out of it or not. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, Concha, uh, I would like to, uh, within this uh, second question, even be more specific for you, uh, from the FAO point of view, what do you think that the FAO could do in the future to, 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 to help on, on these areas? And especially AMIS, uh, I think is a very interesting tool, as Tosso said. Uh, Tosso said. Uh, what, what are the really the main progress on, on, on AMIS and specifically on, on, on information and transparency on stocks? Uh, uh, AMIS was, uh, I think, one of the first initi initiatives that tried to look not so much at the availability of information, but at the quality of the information you have. And I can tell you that what we have found out out of this experience is that the problems uh, are not with the developing countries alone, but also with the developed countries. And that uh, when the modelists uh, take their statistics and run equations, very often they don't uh, realize that the numbers that are behind uh, these statistics are, do not reflect the same concept across countries. I mean, uh, very often even the concept of production is different from one country to the other. But I can tell you that if we have problems, the problems are mainly with the utilization side. It's uh, very difficult, extremely difficult, to know how much of the production is spent with in, in feeding uh, uh, the humans, in feeding the animals, but also how much is wasted along the, the, the marketing chain. And very often <coughs> these post-harvest losses that we, we, we uh, uh, define are often greater than 15%. So uh, making mistakes on one of these elements uh, has a lot of implication for the residual variable, which is almost uh, always the stocks. So uh, when you deal uh, uh, with models that look at stock to use ratio, uh, you have to realize that what you have in your hand is not a very precise measure. It's probably the best you have. So, but you, you, shouldn't, m you shouldn't be so certain that uh, when you report the stocks, every n everyone knows what the concept of stock is. For example, at which moment are stocks measured? Normally, we measure the stocks at the end of the marketing year, just before the new harvest comes in. So, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to have this information from the countries. Often they have the public stock information, but they don't have the private stocks information. So uh, to come up with this kind of uh, metrics is extremely demanding. Uh, there is a country that, uh, better than anyone, even better than the EU, is the Philippines. It's, it's coming up as one of the, of the best countries in, in, in uh, um, um, looking at the data, reporting, at at least for rice, I mean, it's not across all the commodities, but they have uh, quarterly stock surveys, which is uh, almost unique. Uh, so in that sense, you have countries that are well in advance and they don't need the capacity building. They probably should uh, help build this capacity building in other countries. Um, China, uh, China is, is uh, uh, really 
I mean, I don't want to put the blame on China. China is problematic because of the size. It's not so much that it behaves differently from, from the other countries. It's just that the size of its economy is such that really uh, to know what the stock uh, uh, are in, 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 in China would really make the, the, the market much better informed and, and reduce the uncertainty. So uh, they want capacity building. Uh, I think that it's more a resistance, of course, from the point of view of releasing the information, letting the world know how much they have in the stocks. My estimates of stocks in, in, in China are enormous, but uh, they're higher than those of the USDA, very f they're very far apart. I spoke to the USDA, they put everything into feed. Because so, but it's not that they have a better collection of data than we have, it's just uh, at a certain point with the little information you have, you have to make your best to, 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 to draw estimates. So uh, transparency, I think that this actually, I, I tend to disagree with uh, Tassos that said that they are cutting on information collection. I think that countries are becoming more and more aware that it is important for them to know. If they want to make policy decisions that, um, that are sound, they need to have at least some, some good statistic behind to, 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 to support their decisions. So uh, AMIS is a very ambitious pro pro uh, program. We're still far from getting the good statistics. And I say it's not only a problem of developing countries, it's a problem also of developed countries. Thank you. Uh, on a very short uh, question. Uh, um, do you have information about all these uh, uh, reserves that uh, Gabriel mentioned, for instance, in West Africa? We, I, I hear of them when I monitor, when I monitor the, the, the rice market, which is my market, but not all of what you said. Some are very interesting. And one, for instance, I... Uh, one experience that is also uh, um, gaining a lot of uh, popularity in Latin America is uh, storage bags. That they have these storage bags on the farm that allow producers to weather a little bit the price fluctuations. I don't know whether this can be expanded to, uh, uh, exported to, to African, African countries, but it's, it's, it's they're very effective in, Latin, in, the, in the context of Latin America. Thank you. Pablo. Um, well, I agree with uh, with uh, Tassos in when he said that um, when a situation when this derives mostly from exogenous factors, we need to look outside agriculture and, and the sector. Uh, it's relevant, however, to keep an eye on uh, market information, namely statistics, and unfortunately. The trend that we have seen pretty much uh, around the EU member states is uh, a, a reduction uh, on, let's say, funding for the operation of the national statistical offices. And that, in, at the end, will, uh, has uh, translated into, let's say, poorer uh, statistical information available. But also, uh, markets uh, and this, the overall situation has evolved, so therefore, one needs to look at new ways to collect information or even to use information that is, uh, let's say, collected from a, a, an administrative uh, point of view that can, could be used for statistical purposes and this, uh, let's say, market intelligence, which is, which is uh, relevant uh, here. Of course, uh, one, uh, besides the, this part uh, of the statistical information and the part related to uh, increased transparency uh, on, on the markets. One needs also to, to look at uh, how the food chain functions. Uh, and, and here again, we have, uh, uh, we have different problems. Uh, some of them were mentioned early th this morning by uh, uh, Steve McCorrick. And it's really I I important to uh, have an understanding that from for, for, for farmers, they are uh, let's say, mostly squeezed, uh, let's say, between a rock and a hard place, meaning in one hand uh, a, a huge concentration in the input side and on the other side uh, a, a huge concentration in 
uh, in the processing uh, industry and especially in the retail sector. Uh, and this is something that will and has been causing uh, difficulties. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, how do you see this exactly on the price cost squeeze? And if you look uh, recently, the, especially the energy uh, costs being having increased so much have caused these uh, big uh, problems uh, for, 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 for farmers. So in terms of, uh, uh, of the future, this, all of these things need to be translated into sort of uh, mechanisms of, uh, that can be triggered uh, in a more automatic manner, uh, if I could put it like this, uh, so that the, the response would be almost immediate whenever you have uh, market disturbances. And this is what uh, is uh, really critical. Automatism. Yeah. Thank you, Salo. So, um, about m priorities for the future, uh, we'll, we all know that uh, mm, politically, uh, in terms of public policy, uh, the governments have expressed, and our government have, have done so, about coordination, about information and transparency, elimination of trade limitations, and uh, as, as uh, Gabriel also said, increase of production and productivity, which uh, we should increase investment and innovation in that. And uh, of course, uh, safety nets for producers. And there are several kinds of them, and uh, we have been talking about insurance before. But uh, in, in strictly terms of price volatility, I think that uh, we should avoid other compensations for catastrophic events of any kind. We know that both uh, national and European budgets are every year more limited, and, uh, and politicians always fight for stable budgets, and they don't like this kind of uh, budget surprises anyway. So um, I think that the priority should be to provide farmers, and I'm talking about uh, farming producers, of course, to provide them to, uh, with the tools to avoid risk, or, or at least to lessen their effects, or, or to be able to cope with them. Um, I if we could divide this kind of risk between uh, catastrophic risk and business risks, even if business risks can't uh, put benefits at stake, I think we should firstly focus on catastrophic risks. And um, because they, they could really jeopardize the future of a sector, of a region, or um, of a kind of production. And so I think that governments and, and, and policies should first focus on on this kind of risk, no matter what origin uh, they have, and um, whether it's climate or price or whatever. And then, once they are under control, then we, sh we, we, we can go beyond that and, and go to m more uh, ample, more widened uh, type of risks. Um, there are also, I mean, we know that there are pure market options for uh, could could have a pri priority like uh, contracting through the value chain, like stock markets or forward contracting, and and the priority of policy should be on <coughs> on uh, writing uh, and stating a and reliable framework that could um, ease the participation of every farmer on them. So uh, I think that uh, it's not about uh, intervening in the market or creating a public stock exchange or whatever, but creating this legal framework that uh, everyone would feel at ease and w would be sh uh, assured that uh, things are going to work properly. Um, there is also one thing that uh, um, Gabriel said, is that uh, providing bargaining power to farmers. Also, I think that Miranda talked about that. And. Uh, um, association policies, uh, information access for could, could ease the access to, to all these options. Um, in general, information of, of markets and climate risk as local as possible could also not only help farmers to, uh, to work properly but also to create or, or to create these kind of tools as uh, options, markets or exchange or insurances. So maybe the policies could be in creating this information or keeping this information up to date very locally. And, um, and finally, I would like to talk also about uh, capacity building and training. Because uh, we're talking about coping with volatility. And in this sense, 
training in risk management, as, as they are doing, like Dr. Sack explained about peak production, this uh, training in, in helping to diversify how to access to new markets could be, I think, a very valuable type of measure. I think that these are some policies that I think could be considered. Okay, there are uh, very interesting uh, topics on the table uh, about stocks and reserves policy, about uh, coping or preventing. I think that the measure um, position is about coping. Uh, I think also that is important the remark from Tassos that in the future more and more the drivers of uh, price food volatility will be outside of the agriculture in uh, energy, financial markets and other outside of the agriculture. And I think this is a very important question for how to proceed in the future. Also, uh, the automatism that Paolo uh, raised, I think is interesting because this could be a, a, a good uh, uh, way to, to deal with uh, this extreme uh, volatility with some early warning, etc. Now, uh, do you want to cross some comments about uh, all these topics uh, among the panelists? Some uh, uh, additional remark or, or comment before to start with the questions uh, on the floor? Yes. Um, t technology, I, I, a, a lot of... Uh, the discussion has centered about productivity and uh, improvement. I think that one of the major unknown for the future is technology. And uh, uh, nobody has spoken about the GMs in this room. I don't know why, because I think it's highly relevant to the, to the problem of volatility. Because not so much in, in developed countries, but in developing countries. I mean, Bangladesh, China, India are pushing heavily towards uh, uh, GM rise because of their special condition and looking ahead towards uh, climate change. I mean, Bangladesh has this problem of uh, raising waters that can really jeopardize the, 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 the rice. So uh, the technology is going to be one of the critical uh, variables for the future that is uh, most important. I'm not defending GMs, you look at me. Uh <laughs> but I think it's, it's, part, it's part of the discussion and, and I'm a, li a little bit surprised that nobody has mentioned it uh, in this. I, I take advantage of the intervention because one of the questions from the floor is about GMOs okay. and what could be the influence of GMOs on reducing uh, volatility of uh, food prices. Then I take advantage. Do you want to say something about this, or maybe some of the pan I, about GMOs? Yes, or? specifically because it's related with the comment from uh, Concha. Do you want to say? Yeah, I can say something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly one of the, the yeah. I, I, I think that the, the, the GM question is highly politicized. It's uh, so it's very difficult to to uh, tackle it without having moving the spirits of the people and, and, and becoming very emo emotional. I think that would be better to distance. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, uh, there are certain countries that face very particular c conditions that uh, uh, and, and, and you have to understand them when they want to push. I mean, you have you cannot solve with normal, t certain things you can solve with normal hybridization and things like that, but for other uh, characteristics you need the GMs. So, um, is it necessary to go that way? I mean, I think it's a, co it's, it's a choice that the, the, the country should, should make, but knowing uh, very well the implications. Today, uh, to embark in GMs can really cut you from major markets when you trade. So these are things that uh, uh, you have to wait when you decide to embark into that direction. Uh, and I want to say that you don't need GMs for increasing productivity. There is a, a huge gap, producti productivity gap that needs to be filled before you, you think of GMs for that particular purpose. Good question. Well, uh, no, on, on, on two things. One is uh, 
on, on climate change as a driver. I think uh, it's an issue that uh, we haven't mentioned uh, too little during this meeting, and uh, it would be one of the big drivers. And about GMOs, I like very much uh, this issue. Uh, Oxfam is a diverse organization, mm, very diverse also in opinion, so what I'm going to say is a personal stance. I repeat, it's a personal stance, it's not Oxfam opinion. I agree very much in the, that GMOs are not uh, needed strictly to increase productivity, but in some cases they can be very useful. In my opinion, the, opi the, the problem in GMOs is not uh, in the technical problems that you can have. It's a, a problem of um, um, property rights. In some cases, and uh, especially with climate change, they can be very useful. They can be useful in order to tackle uh, diseases. Uh, I, I saw an example that it was very striking for me. Uh, I didn't know that 95% uh, of uh, the, the bananas that we are consuming come from one single strain. With GMOs, this wouldn't be necessary. It's one single strain because only one single strain survived to a, a fungus. You can use GMO in order to put the resistant fungus in very different strains. This is only an example. Uh, they, have, uh, they, they can be useful, but the problem is, again, market concentration and who is controlling the, the technology. But I don't want to focus the debate in GMO because it would be, uh, it would take all the the, <laughs> the rest of the time. Okay, some other cross uh, comment, and then we start with the rest of the question from the floor. Paulo, um, I'm not going to enter in this uh, GMO uh, the debate. Uh, I don't think that it's useful at this stage. Uh, one one comment uh, regarding, uh, uh, let's say, less developed countries. Uh, it was mentioned uh, that it's necessary to uh, invest in agriculture, uh, especially to produce more. That is true, but it's not, from my point of view, the entire truth, because you need also to invest in infrastructures. Uh, because you might produce whatever you want in the quantities that you want, but if you don't have the infrastructures to bring it from the production area into uh, either the cities where it is consumed or to the ports where you will export it and bring it uh, to, to, to other markets, it's gone. So this is just a, a comment uh, that uh, I would like to, to, to leave here. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I didn't, in, in my intervention, I didn't uh, refer too much to, uh, to risk management and uh, to the, the issue of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the imbalance of power in the food chain and how farmers uh, are, are squeezed in there, but they, they are, uh, there are really relevant uh, aspects uh, on, on that. Yeah. I'd like to comment on, on this thing of climate change because I think it's, it's it's really an interesting thing for the future to come. And, uh, and w I think what one of the priorities that uh, I was talking about before is on credit, on access to credit, because we think that farmers are going to need to uh, invest in order to adapt their productions, in order to change varieties. And I think that uh, financial measures like uh, credit or, or insurances could be one of the tools to use so that they, they, they can have this reliabi reliability on their income so that they can invest in the future. Just comment on, on this. We can see this uh, already on, on the field. In, in our project in, Burvi in Burkina Faso, the farmers take the insurance to go to the bank to as, a, as a guarantee for the credit. So this is a reality already. Okay, let's go to the questions from the floor. Um, first is GMOs, uh, okay, is more, more or less answered. 
The second question, there are two or three questions about uh, financial markets. Um, uh, the question is uh, for Tasso and Paolo. Do you support uh, new and more restricting rules for trading with derivatives, futures and options markets? But also other question for uh, about this uh, financial market regulation is for Tassos, talking about the volatility could be a useful factor to develop um, European future markets. But they are asking what will be the regulation for that, because until now the European is not unifying uh, the, the regulation in this area, and each country really is uh, uh, making some, some uh, progress on that. Then for Tassos and for Paolo. Tassos. Well, uh, <coughs> first of all, in, uh, there are several efforts and uh, changes that have been made. On the focus and since should be on more transparency in the manner in which uh, financial markets work. It's possible to set up futures markets already, but of course you need a minimum level of, of price, a minimum size. So you cannot impose it with decrease. It either is going to be there where it's possible or it will not be there. And I don't think that that has been uh, the problem. The problem is more in terms of the different structure of agricultural, different sizes of farms we have, and different requirements to get more and more farmers involved in that. In fact, we have even training measures and uh, measures in the rural development program that allow and help farmers to go in that direction. So if we haven't arrived there, it's not because the possibility is not there, but it's not, it hasn't been used and we have to derive uh, some uh, conclusions uh, about what uh, is the case. What was the other one on financial market? Oh, and uh, another issue we need to, the <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, the frameworks are uh, being uh, proposed. Now we have to clarify whether it's more restrictive or not, what we mean by restrictive. Uh, my personal feeling it has to be much more transparent, but if we want to find some scapegoats in uh, excluding uh, speculators and the rest, I think a simple look at the statistics is enough to indicate that especially in serial markets is not the increase in speculators that caused most of the problem. It's a very significant increase of rather innocent funds that moved in in an attempt to diversify the portfolio <laughs> and at the end uh, end up increasing co-movement because of the small size of agricultural markets compared to the others. So more transparency would help much more than any other restrictive measure. There are uh, you want me to take that? Sector, yes. uh, yeah, the dairy sector and intervention. Well, what's the role of intervention looking at prices? It's not only for dairy sector, it's for <coughs> all the sector. We have made a conscious move some years ago to turn intervention into the safety net. The intervention price should not be the price that leads farmers' decisions. It should be the price that protects farmers when we have a collapse of the price. And this is exactly the case. One of the scenarios, and I put it on purpose, indicates conditions under which average prices at the EU could fall. And if average prices at the EU could fall, there are going to be several, se some member states where prices would hold, fall even further and there is going to be some intervention, but it's going to be limited. The same thing that it's private storage is limited and would allow some stabilization of the prices until things move better. But what is interesting in the current context is not to isolate intervention for the broader measures. When you have a fixed budget, and that's a big advantage actually of the cap, you have to think carefully what's the efficiency of the policy instruments you're using. And we have the example with the announcement yesterday that we will have financial discipline, 1.4% cut in direct payments of farmers to accommodate the budget. So the more you want to give to certain specific products and markets, the more you have to take out of the direct decoupled income support for farmers. And there is where, for those that nostalgically look in the, to the past of intervention, they need to go and do some back, uh, backward analysis to see all this money that w went to intervention, from all this money that was spent, how much went back to the farmers and how much disappeared across the chain. I think OECD had done somewhere an analysis that indicated about less than 10%, in fact 7% was going back to the farmers, while the efficiency of transmitting direct payments to farmers' income was more than 90%. 
Okay, thank you. A question for uh, Paolo. Saying yeah. so in the context of uh, this new price environment, do you think that uh, some measures or on the new CAP, such as uh, greening measures, can impact uh, the farmer's productivity capacity and, as a consequence, uh, affect uh, food prices within the European Union? Well, this is not going to be easy to respond. <laughs> uh, well, of course, I was expecting that because all the easy questions were gone. No, seriously, uh, what I believe that question entails is uh, some of the things that are being discussed, namely, uh, what can you do or what you cannot do in uh, ecological focus areas. Uh, and uh, what was the spirit of the political agreement reached uh, between the institutions uh, on late last year? I mean, this, what, what they had in mind was a situation where this would not result on uh, uh, a reduction of the potential of production in the EU. And this is something that we, as Copa Cogeca, that we pushed forward and we made uh, the, both the, the Council and the Parliament and the Commission aware. Now, uh, we are in a situation where uh, delegated acts are, uh, are being uh, presented and uh, uh, being cleared, and this is one of the major issues. Uh, like what can you do and what cannot you, you cannot do in ecological focus areas. Uh, for instance, if you can uh, uh, or not do, uh, for instance, protein crops, etc., etc. And what if at the end of the day this will translate in, in practical terms into a set aside uh, that uh, and coming back a bit to uh, in a slightly different manner to what uh, existed uh, more than 10 years ago. But this, this is critical. And for us, what we want to make sure is that there is, that we are not uh, mortgaging our potential of production. Okay. Uh, Gonzalo, uh, a question is saying that uh, in the future, volatility will impact not just farmers, but all stakeholders along the food chain. And the question is if ENESA is uh, considering the possibility to extend the insurance activities to the other actors in the food chain, not just farmers. Thank you. Well, the, the question is that um, the, the, the first answer will be not by the moment, because uh, th that's for sure, because uh, we have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The thing is that uh, we are sure, I mean, up to now we have been dealing with a budget of uh, almost 300 million euros per year for strictly for farmers. And now we, we are below 200 million. So uh, we are cutting subsidies for, for these premiums of, um, of the um, policy, uh, insurance policies. So at this moment we are focusing on trying to uh, uh, not n um, to keep the system as it is. For the future, we, we have a, l a lot of plans for it, like uh, revenue, insurances. We, ha we have been talking about also about this, uh, why not share <coughs> the risk between, uh, between uh, among all the links of the chain? But uh, I think in, in, in a crisis period like this one, where there is less budget for, for uh, for subsidies, many regional governments have uh, have uh, lost their budget at all, completely for for this kind of insurance. I think we should stick what for what we have, and the future it could be. Okay. <laughs> Next question is for uh, Concha and Gabriel. The question is. Do short-term stabilization policies do more harm than benefits? Uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would pass this <laughs> to someone else if I could. Um, 
Well, uh, the short-term policies, I mean, uh, uh, it depends very much, again, whether they're well targeted and, 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 and well, and, and, and don't distort uh, uh, the, the markets. I mean, it's uh, long-term versus short-term. I mean, they follow the same principle. There are not no difference between short-term and long-term policies. Uh, normally, the short-term policies is, uh, are the, those that uh, allows you to react uh, in one season, especially, uh, I mean, if sectorial, it could be prices when you, you have support prices, thing like that. Whether they work better, it depends very a lot, and, and, and again, it depends very much on their objective and whether you, you, you uh, again, I mean, the, the principle is that uh, you should intervene uh, really trying to distort the, 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 the less market and target uh, the, the actions to the, the few people that uh, uh, cannot, uh, do, do not have the instrument to, to react to the market. So I wouldn't make a b big difference between the, the, the long term and the short term. I think they follow the same. Uh, I agree very much with this. Uh, it depends, and it depends also about how wide is the, the band that you have to intervene. And even if you have uh, goodwill to do things, uh, some, uh, some uh, times a measure to intervene in prices, it has been because there is a problem and you have to do something and you have to do it. In other cases, it, it has been corruption, as it seems it, it seems it has been the case in Thailand that the price of rice it has been a, a political support for the, the government uh, to, to get the vote. So it depends very much. Uh, things can be done in a good way and in a bad way. And the <laughs> harm to farmers, organizations, and uh, traders can happen always. And uh, I'm th this is a point from the next one. We, we have to look at ways uh, to compensate these kinds of harm when the intervention is necessary. Uh, just because uh, there was a reference to the Thai policies. Um, on the Thai policies, it's true that they have been extremely bad for the, for the, for the market, but um, there was an election run by the government on the base that they would support the rice prices. So it's true that uh, uh, they, they probably couldn't do commit to do this thing because they would have gone and they did go against their, their WTO commitments. But what they did is really to respect what had been promised before the elections. So uh, the, the question is that the government did not uh, uh, back, back up they did not withdraw this policy when they realized that it wasn't sustainable. Uh, what happened is that when they implemented a very high price policy, a producer price policy, they did not expect that India would at the same time uh, lift their export ban. So uh, they, they thought that they had the market power to, to keep the international prices high. This did not happen. And of course, it has resulted in a lot of distortion. Today, they have a lot, a lot of stuff that they have to put on the market, and it's causing prices to collapse. But I want to make a remark that people don't realize, is that China has been doing very similar policies. They have uh, set the price policies to the producers very high, very much so because they wanted to keep uh, um, the farmers on the rural areas because they could not yet absorb uh, a massive exodus to the cities. Uh, and they have been building stocks. At least we believe because stock information is very limited. So uh, today, the same thing that uh, we see in Thailand that they have to put the stocks on the market may happen tomorrow. It happened already in the early 2000s when both India and China start releasing stocks heavily. Uh, and that depressed the price tremendously. This is something that I dread to see repeated uh, in the next few years. But if what uh, estimates of stocks, uh, if, if this is true, this may happen, and this may be a source of a lot of additional volatility. 
Uh, there are several comments about the importance of technological change, uh, but uh, uh, considering there are some uh, vicious circle on that, because the comment is uh, the high volatility is affecting the technological, technological change and investments, but at the same time, technological change and investments could increase the productivity and then also reduce the volatility. In that sense, we have a special of the, the loop, no? let's say, the, the situation of the markets and the volatility is affecting the, the, the investment on, on, on technological change, but at the same time, this technological change could really uh, support uh, some uh, reducing or limiting uh, volatility. Uh, the two last questions. Um, uh, one is also another intentional question about uh, how to cope with volatility. And they, the question for uh, Tassos and Concha is uh, intervention pricing versus competitive market. Let's say what would be the, the, the best uh, way to, to cope with uh, volatility through the intervention or through the competitive markets? Well, uh, that's a totally false dilemma because we have, uh, and I will repeat that, a 60 billion euro annually a budget. I don't know any other part of the world that has that budget. And this is a combination of measures. You can use 60 billion euros for intervention. No doubt about that. You can put a price at, a, at uh, the sky, and we've seen where prices are right now, and that would lead all the policy decisions of the farmers. And by doing that, you will spend all this money on building up stocks and getting rid of, of these stocks in the way we used in the past. The only adjustment we need to make is at the level of intervention prices. There is a completely different approach, which is to abolish completely the cap and focus on what has been termed as competitive markets although that implies that markets are perfect, and I don't see them perfect, I see many imperfections. But that means no budget. And then there is a combination of measures. And let me try to give an, I gave an answer before on uh, the intervention and what's the role of intervention. I will do it through the productivity, and I will come back to your greening question, because it's very interesting. <coughs> and it shows a completely different way of addressing policy. What's the issue with the ecologically focused area? 5% of arable crops which means really 2%, because the 3% is already landscape features and out of production. And what are we talking about this 2%? Whether we can baptize an oil seed into a protein crop. Because the issue is whether soya is produced on ecologically focused area or not. Yes, soya can be produced if people want to do that. The real question is, why have our farmers not produced soya so far? And the answer is very clear. If you assume that instead of importing 30 million tons of soya, we produce 30 million tons of soya in Europe, and we can do it, we, the world, would be short of 70 million tons of cereals, which we produce, 40 of which can be produced to the rest of the world on average yields, and there would be a shortage of 30 million tons of cereals. Our farmers have understood that way before any policy debate. And what is the, the other uh, interesting element? We're not talking about ecologically focused area here, crop diversification there, permanent pasture land there. These are measures that are supposed to work in parallel. With crop uh, diversification, anybody that wants to do protein crops can do protein crops on the 5%, for example, of the area. This would be very good for protein crops. It would be very good for the environment and would be very good in the long term for productivity. What it would be bad, however, it's going to be against the logic that takes the same farmer, the same enterprises, and considers that the same farmer could cut him or herself in three parts, and one part would be participating in a cereals, the other in an oilsis, and the other in a protein group. And this is the completely different manner of seeing policy. One is going back into a product-based policy, and the other is looking ahead into a policy that bases itself on land, land use, and land use changes. And that is a fundamental difference of approach, of philosophy, and a policy paradigm. 
we want it or we don't want it, we like it or we don't like it, but at least we should have an open debate about what are the real issues and what are the side issues. Uh, I agree with with uh, Tassos that uh, uh, when you deal with intervention, it depends what is the price. And, and I come back to the example of, of Thailand. The price was set much above the market. So basically, the, the, the government became the sole buyer of the rice uh, in the country. Uh, the, the, the effects were, were bad for the, were very good at the short term for the producers, but of course the the, the, the in the long term they, they, they lost markets. They, uh, the country uh, had uh, to, to as an enormous debt to, 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 to reimburse to the banks. Uh, I think that it caused a, a drop in the, in the GDP uh, of, of 2%. So it, it has a lot of implication that has to be seen. It doesn't mean that the producers shouldn't be protected. They have, uh, uh, and, and this is something that uh, we recommend, that if you want to, to support the, the, the producers of rice in Thailand, which are, are really very poor, you must uh, use some other kind of measures that would assist them in, you know, like the, like the, 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 the research, the capacity building, the, the the, the insurance program, those that are less distorting. So uh, the question is not not giving or giving support to the producers, it's what kind of support you give, being very careful that of the implications. The Thailand today is the third largest uh, uh, exporter. It has lost its, uh, its rank as a prime, uh, prime uh, exporter of rice in the world just because of this policy. Uh, I want to, to suggest to, to talk about the, the structure demand, which could be a, a kind of solution for this kind of problem. It's about uh, uh, buying the production uh, in a targeted way to a special groups uh, of, of farmers who need a, a better price or special conditions in order to be included in the market. This is uh, an example, uh, the, the P4P program, Purchase for Progress, which prepares the farmers' organization, and uh, they enjoy uh, special conditions in order to be integrated in the market. This is not uh, special prices for everyone, it's for certain groups that they need it more. <coughs> Last question for uh, Tassos. Uh, do you think that uh, the new measures introduced in the CAP reform uh, to cope with uh, price volatility are uh, enough? Or do you think that uh, additional measures should be adopted in the future reforms? It all depends on how it's going to be implemented. And I think we still have not digested one of the big changes. I mean, we keep talking about greening and the potential impact it has on whether we have or we don't have intervention price. But one other, the third element of a major change of cap reform is the redistribution of support. And the manner by which support has been redistributed or is going to be redistributed among member states, the regionalization will have a major implication. If you, in an ideal world, land prices should reflect the productivity of land and should give you an indication of what type of average regional level of support you should have because you should give a basic payment to the farmer would harmonize and then they do whatever else they want. How member states are going to imp implement that could differ a lot and will have an impact on asset values of the farmers. And by having an impact on asset values, it will affect actually the manner by which their productivity will also depend. So whether we need more or less measures for volatility, we'll have, we'll have to see what the, imp the real impact of production is going to be. The, th the second element that was very interesting is the very limited appetite of member states to use measures in the second pillar that aim at address volatility, yeah. including insurance schemes, but how do they aim to do it? They aim to do it at what is pertinent, which is a local, the regional, the pr production specific measure. And in a, the context of fixed budgetary allocations and a reduction in national money spent on agricultural and rural development measures, that could explain why priorities have been given in one er and rather than the other area, but it might at the, at the end of the day create more problems for some specific sectors than uh, what otherwise would have been the case. 
Okay, uh, Aleko Saris uh, asked for some comments, but Aleko, one minute, please, because Alberto is saying that it's time. Um, I have uh, two or three brief, very brief comments. First of all, in response to Tassos's comment, whether it's a new world. It is, and I'll tell you why it's a new world. Because we have a lot of better information and a lot more connectedness in the markets. This means that you cannot really uh, easily reduce variability in the markets the way you used it the old way. So I would say that implies that for the developed countries, the best way to do it is to have as many possibilities as possible and in institutions to manage risk. Futures, options, whatever other instruments, and let the farmers do it. They can do it if they have the instruments, but we don't have the instruments. That's one. For developing countries, it's a little bit different. But frankly, the way you were talking about it uh, suggests that there is a bit of misunderstanding of what these institutions do. Serial banks are not stabilization institutions. They are banking institutions. They are supposed to put um, uh, uh, your stocks in a bank in order to get funds, in order not to stabilize. They are stabilization institutions. The second thing is that stocks, almost all governments have been confusing uh, stocks for what I called emergency purposes with stocks of what could be flow purposes. Most governments look at stocks as a flow instrument, in other words, to deal with the shortage. That's the absolutely wrong way to look at stocks because you just uh, uh, diminish the stocks and you don't replenish it. You don't have a rule to replenish it. But when you look at it as an emergency instrument which is designed to give some supplies to a particular part of the market that cannot be supplied easily by the market, this is the externality, then you can reduce your stock, but then you have to replenish it. And the idea is for the stock to always stay there. It's an instrument of emergency. And that's why the emergency idea is a valid idea. And it's a, it's a, a, a but that involves uh, small stocks. So that's what I wanted to say. Also, your issue of the insurance, you are quite right in the sense that the uh, insurance, and especially the policy that you did in Ethiopia, I know of this project. It worked, yes, but the nice thing, it was all subsidies. And uh, <laughs> so if we are to give subsidies, fine, then of course it will work. Yeah, thank you. If, if can I, I, I will answer. Uh, it's really difficult to, be, to do it uh, fast, but I will try. I didn't say that serial banks are stabilization institutions. I didn't say they are to cope at the household level with these problems. They can decrease the price that people have to pay, uh, have to pay for, for cereals. This is not stabilization, it's to cope with. Um, we are talking about new and old ideas. Uh, talking about emergency interventions as an availability crisis, this is old ideas. There are now access crises, and this is different because access prices depend on the level of prices and affect a millions and millions of persons. So it's not possible to think in there is a, a lack of availability in this concrete region. This happens yet, but this is not part of the, the new crisis. The new crises are different. And uh, um, subsidies and insurance. Yes, it's social protection. I said insurance and social protection. And social protection is subsidy by definition, but a needed subsidy. Okay, thank you very much to the panelists and the floor for the questions. And now, Alberto Garrido, do you have uh, the final comments from the seminar? Okay. Before before uh, closing, I'd like to give you uh, no, we don't have um, okay final remarks. Um, Alberto, yes. Lucky the last question. Yeah. Very ra the question about C C I new initiatives and new constituents of the fund. Mm -hmm. no, we have not prepared some okay. of the answers. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, I think that the last question is implicit in some. The last question about if there are some new developments or crises or initiatives that could really uh, be uh, introduced and take into account in the in the in the Ulysses team are implicit in the questions and answers of this panel. And I think in that sense we can take this uh, this uh, debate. Uh, very quickly, no, because very I promise I promise that to 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 Alexander. Uh, I think that uh, th the point that was raised yesterday about the definition of volatility is very interesting and uh, implied volatility. But of course, it's very <coughs> reductive in the sense that it it can only be applied for those products that have uh, some options that have that are traded on exchanges. So uh, it could be uh, an area of investigation on how you could extend that to those products that do not have, okay. that are not traded on we exchanges, we that's all. We take note, and also this distinction between ordinary or extraordinary volatility and the different kinds of volatility, etc. cetera. We, we, we take note. Thank you very much. Thank Alberto. you. A uh, very short survey uh, evaluating the, the seminar is being, being handling. Please uh, take one minute to fill it out and it is will help us in organizing the next seminar. Just uh, a few comments. Uh, dissemination is a crucial goal of the project. We take it seriously. This is one particular aspect, the international seminar. There will be another one. We've, uh, we've been publishing policy briefs. There is a website with all the materials at, and we have a Twitter account that is uh, over there. Uh, did we accomplish the goals of the seminars? Yes, we discussed alternative approaches, methods, and data, discussed policy implications and approaches, got feedback, more than we expected from all of you, did focus not only on the European Union, but also on in developing countries, which is one of the focus of the project. We structured this seminar along Ulysses work packages and got input also from another couple of seven framework program projects like Food Secure and Transport Project. We only presented uh, finished work, but there is much more coming along as we uh, produced uh, all the work packages of the Ulysses. Uh, in fact, we have five scientific seminars due next uh, July, uh, three more policy briefings, interim and policy uh, reforms, and we will publish a book next year. Um, we will publish as a way forward to this seminar all the presentations, if, if presenters allow us to do it, in the FarmD website and also on the Ulysses website. Uh, we will write a short memo to be finished next week, and we will uh, edit the materials that have been uh, recorded. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge, of course, uh, the European Commission, Barna Kovacs, our officer, Thanos Haniotis, uh, top officer of the DG Agriculture. We also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Forum for Agricultural Market and Development at the World Bank, FarmD, and in particular to uh, those, uh, those, these people that uh, could not come to Madrid, but they were being help they, they've been helping us from Washington, Roy Parisat, Anna Green, and Tracy Johnson. They provided us a web page that allow us to disseminate this activity uh, to the world quite effectively. Also, of course, FAO, another partner of this, uh, of this seminar, uh, Moulad, uh, Christian, Jean Vallier, uh, George Rastromanikis, and Felix Baquedano. Uh, the uh, FAO provided uh, world-class speakers great support and media dissemination of this activity as well. A big thank you to chairs, presenters, and panel members, attendants, all of you, Ulysses members of the advisory board, Calpe, Cabero, Ferenzi, uh, Klusterboer, McCorriston, and Stack, and of course all Ulysses partners that I've mentioned here, and finally those behind the scenes, uh, our staff, Segran, Anna Felis, uh, who is be helping us really uh, organizing this and really running all the things, all the details. Katerina Kucerova, uh, and Esperanza Luque, Segran staff, they were they've been really helpful. Uh, Gate, which is a European uh, uh, media service. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Excelente. And also uh, the, the hotel uh, technicians. Thank you very much. And have, have a nice uh, trip back home. And we will see you uh, mostly uh, on, on the internet and also perhaps in Brussels next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.